So it's a bit of home territory. I'm in Ben Keith's office in uh, London, and we're going to talk about Ben's career for a change and uh, put it on the Star Sports website. So, Ben, can you tell us? Um, from the very beginning, please, when you first became aware and interested in betting? Well, uh, when I was a child, I never would have uh, watched horse racing or, 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 or even thought about having a bet. And uh, at the age of 12, um, I remember uh, my dad coming into the kitchen and saying, uh, come to the dogs with me. Uh, my dad was a solicitor in Worthing, and uh, I grew up in, in a village called Hurstbeer Point. And my mum was supposed to go with him. It was a work function. Well, I don't know what it was, some sort of like work social thing. And my mum didn't want to go. She said, go on out from under my feet, you go to the dogs. I said, dog racing? I don't want to go dog racing. I would have no interest in dog, dog racing. I went to the dogs. I remember we were sitting in the restaurant above the bookies and I had a two pound place bet on a dog called uh, Sarah Jones. I think it was an A11 or an A12 first race of the night. Anyway, I don't know if she won or placed, but the bet won. It was a two pound bet on the toad, and that was it. I, I, I was, uh, you know, the, the excitement of the betting ring, the lights over the track at night. I think that's always that's always quite intoxicating. Um, you know, the dogs. I, I mean, I love dogs as animals uh, as, as well. I love to watch a greyhound run. I like to watch a greyhound have a hand slip or a trial. Um, and I just fell in love with the game then. But the betting ring is what really attracted me. I loved watching Tic Tac. I used to make notes of different Tic Tac, racing language, um, fractions. I learned how to clerk as a child. I was the school bookie. I did work experience with um, lots of different bookies. The first bookmaker I did work experience with was Bo Brown of West End Racing. And um, my dad said to me before I went out the door that day, I remember going out the back door and I was walking up to Hassock Station and I was shadow clerking, which means I was standing next to the clerk and practicing clerking. I would have been about 13. Um, and my dad said, you're going to work for lots of different bookies and see lots of different bookies work. Keep the good, leave the bad. And um, uh, I always remember that. And other bookmakers who were kind to me were Neil Channing, uh, when he used to bet on course with Steve Todd, I did work experience with him. Martin Johnston, later in my teens when I was, say, 17, 18, Martin would have been my first mentor of gem racing. You know, an incredibly professional, uh, incredibly professional, professional gambler. Um, a real um, Rolls Royce of a bookmaker, a figures man and a gentleman. I, I would say that Martin was... Um, uh, he, he, he sort of taught me the way to be, be respectful, be smart. Um, he always deals with clients. Well, I, I, I watched him work when I was that age and I picked up, I'd like to think good things. But um, something I learned from Bo Brown, Neil Channing and Martin Johnston was that they, um, they, they, they wanted to enable, they wanted to educate, they wanted to give others a chance. And when I look at the game now, it's very hard for on-course bookmakers to get into the game. The back row pitches aren't worth anything. It, you know, opening an independent betting shop now is going to cost a lot of money and it's a big gamble. It's hard for young people to get into the game. And I never forget what um, uh, the work experience I was given um, as a teenager at City Index Sports, obviously, too. Um, there was a, a, a Cohen, the on-course bookmaker, he gave me work experience with Bubbles. God rest his soul, he used to be his um, uh, helper and Bubbles used to get me into Plumpton or Brighton for free and I used to go and watch and help and it was great fun and I'm very, very grateful to those people and I would say that's something I've carried on, which is wherever possible, giving young people a chance in the game. Okay, Ben, you obviously did your um, apprenticeship with the bookmakers, but was punting ever a serious uh, part of your early career? Uh, yes, definitely career. I mean, look, when I was a kid, I used to go to the dogs. I loved going to the dogs every day at school. I would get, before I went to school, I would um, get the sporting life and the racing post. I was the school bookie. 
um, and all the teachers, all the boys of all ages used to come to me at break time and bet. I used to bet on the, uh, you know, sporting events and I used to bet uh, on, on school events, say like the first team and the rugby or, or the cross country, things like that, next head boy, all good betting events. And uh, even at that age, I think I learned the value of information because a couple of years I had someone come and whisper the name of the next head boy to me. So uh, I ha uh, was, uh, was able to adjust my prices, should I say. But um, it, uh, it, it's... It was a fantastic start. I mean, look, I, I, I used to wash cars every Sunday. It was off school. I'd go and wash cars. I'd get my hands on a tenner. Um, I'd, uh, you know, um, have, I'd have enough money from taking the bets at school, being a school bookie, to buy my sporting life, buy my racing post. I used to read Pat Kelly's com column in the Evening Argus. He's a very good judge, and that's a great column, the Evening Argus, do for Hove Dogs. And yeah, I used to study the form and Lofty, Martin Chapman, who um, works for Star Sports uh, to this day, he would have been my first punting teacher. Um, he's, a, he's a good judge of dog racing, a good judge of price also, that, you know, there's two different things. Um, and um, I used to see Lofty at Portsmouth when they had open racing there. I used to see Lofty at Hove Dogs when he used to work for Bo Brown. We'd go through the card together. I'd dig out a few. Um, I mean, look, at a young age, I got, I got involved in silly things. I remember once I went to the Dogs and Chris Eubank was fighting that night and I had a maximum bet in the last race and I didn't want to have no discipline and lose all the money beforehand and I had a tenner at one to ten in, 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 in the back house betting shop there, uh, thinking, right, I'll have 11 quid at the end of the night, This we can't get beat, Eubank, and I'm going to put it all on my maximum bet anyway. You know the score, Eubank didn't win. I think he drew or something like that. I lost my tenner, and of course the dog in the last race won. But um, I, I did work experience at City Index, and um, I started work with them a week after I finished my A-levels. My first boss there was a man called Paul Austin, who was a lovely man, really nice guy. I'd love to, to know what Paul Austin is doing now. I'd love to meet up with him. He was such a good, good guy. Um, and then I, um, one day out of the blue, Kelvin Richardson, who uh, was a client of City Index, and I'd met him at the Dogs, uh, uh, a real character, he said to me, look, there's this guy, he, he's a good judge on the football, he's, he's um, working for Victor Chandler, he wants to set up a spread betting firm um, for Victor Chandler. I said, interesting, what's his name? He said, his name's Tony Bloom. And I said, oh right, okay, I, I don't think I'd met this guy or heard of this guy. And um, the, the next, uh, a week later, I, I was um, in Richards, which was a very nice restaurant in Inhove, and I had a, a, a brief lunch. I was 19 uh, years of age with Tony, and he said, well, do you want the job? I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'd love to come. Oh, another week later, I was on a plane on the way to Gibraltar, and um, I was there for six months, and for whatever reason, um, they couldn't get the spread betting going. There was a problem with the license or something like that, some uh, silly uh, licensing problem. And um, one day the seniors who, who worked upstairs in the racing room came down. They said, we'd been out last night with someone associated, the tra it was the trainer or the owner of a horse called Pension Fund. And uh, that they, they all got pissed and, and the owner or the trainer said, look, this is gonna be 33 to one tomorrow. This should be favourite, and we think it's going to win. I backed it at 33s and 25s to win 10 grand. It went off, I think, about 6 to 1, and it won. And we were all on it in the office. And I went into work the next day, and um, I said to uh, um, Tony, I said, look, thanks a lot. My, uh, you're, you're betting on these Asian handicaps. I don't uh, know if I really... Uh, um, I think that's going to last. Uh, um, I'm going to go and become a bookie. It's my dream. So I went off with my 10 grand and obviously did my very best to knock that out quickly, you know, betting on cricket runs and doing other silly things like that that I did in my 20s uh, when I was pissed. And uh, yeah, that, that's where it all started. Um, but what an error that was. I thought Asian handicap betting 
wasn't gonna last. What a fool. Yeah, that was uh, that wasn't my finest hour. But look, uh, you know, uh, you, you've got to live with your decisions. Many people uh, might think that Star Sports has had a fairly meteoric rise. Um, you've sort of burst into the um, public sort of view in the last few years. So what that when did, when did all this start? When did you first stand up at Star Sports? Um, when did I first bet at Star Sports? Well, when I came back at 20, I worked with a, a man called Barry Slaney. He was a bookmaker who was retired. He had a few pictures left. And I, I wasn't old enough to be a bookie up to be 21. So I used to stand next to Barry and he used to take a few bets. That was in the days when the rails bookies didn't have boards. They just sort of put a flap with their name over the rail and they'd shout out a horse they wanted to lay. Um, and then I got a betting shot. I think I would have been 21, 22 in Sutton Common Road in Sun Sutton. And I bet under the name of Star Racing for the first time. Um, uh, that that was uh, baptism of fire. I mean, the staff were uh, crooked off the scale. Uh, they were waiting for me, and I learned a lot there. Um, but uh, and then then went went went. The next step would have been um, I bet Roger Cairns, who owns Sittingbourne you know, Central Park. Uh, he gave me a pitch there, and that was, I would say, my first break. The first time I, I got some profile, I would have been, what, 24, 25, something like that, betting at Sittingbourne. And uh, that was a cracking pitch. The nicest people I've met in Greyhound Racing were at Sittingbourne. The nicest ring I've worked in um, was at Sittingbourne. And I always used to win there. Every Sunday night, I'd go there. I didn't take colossal money. We used to go there. We used to take 20 grand, but we used to work together, the bookies, getting the prices right, not trying to knife each other like it's been, I've seen at other dog tracks. They, they, the bookies, John Wilson, Steve Warner, they were nice guys. And John's daughter, Joe, we all used to work together to get the prices right. I used to take about 20 grand, but I took it sweetly. I laid lots of dogs and I was winning and winning and winning there. And then, then I moved to get the, the pitch at Walthamstow and I think I would have been about 25, 26 then. And that's when I got a lot more profile. So that would have been about 12 years ago. Um, and then whilst I was at Walthamstow, um, I um, was doing a lot of my own punting. I was winning punting, but the grass was greener, I thought. And I looked at my heroes in betting, say like Tony Morris and John Humphreys and all these other uh, bookies who'd done well. They'd all got shops and I bought myself half a dozen betting shops. It took my eye off the punting. I thought, no, the way forward is to open a chain of betting shops. At the time, firms like Mervyn Wilson and Jack Brown were, were uh, getting shops, selling them, getting shops, selling them, making a fortune anyway. I bought them at just the wrong time. The value of shops went down. Um, that was a terrible error. I mean, um, you know, that took me close. That took me close. I nearly went under then. Um, uh, and then one, whilst I was Waltham, at Walthamstow, I opened a credit office above a betting shop. Uh, uh, no, at the back of a betting shop we had in Patcham, I started taking phone bets. Then when I sold the shops, um, I, I sold a couple for a few quid, which was good, and I closed a couple. But we had a betting shop in Goring in Worthing. There was a credit office, a, a flat above there. I, we used to, we wired the SIS from the shop to the um, to the office upstairs. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, don't know who did that for us. Um, and um, I don't think we ever paid a, a penny rent on the flat because Betfred had the shop. They said, "Oh yeah, yeah." Well, they bought the shop off me. They said, "Yeah, we'll sort that 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 rent out." And we were there for years, and they never called us. Um, they were a pleasure to deal with Betfred. I must say, we sold them a couple of shops. They were gentlemen to deal with. Um, and so we were there for a long time. Uh, and whilst I was there. I got my first big punter. He's a landowner in the West Country, big, big punter. And I caught him at the wrong time. I was laying in big. I learned then I hedged a bit of it, which was an error, just a little bit. Uh, but, you know, uh, I didn't get paid by the punter. It was 600 grand. Um, and I, I was absolutely on my ass. Then I had to sell my house. Uh, to, to get the equity out of the house to keep the business going. Um, and I'd say that um, when I got to uh, about 30 is when 
it sort of just started to level off a bit and I learned to be a bit more patient and I learned to um, let the business come to me. <laughs>